Amen. Well, good Wednesday evening to you. I'm thankful that God's allowed us to come back, meet together again. Thankful for the blessings and mercies He's supplied. He's been good to us, been better to us than we ever deserved. I'm thankful that uh, He's promised us He'd never leave us, never forsake us. And I'm thankful tonight that He's still able to answer prayers. He's, he's been good to us. I hope tonight that you've come praying. I hope tonight you've come lifting me up. I hope tonight you've come expecting to, to see God move. I really appreciate each one of you being here tonight. I appreciate every home and family represented. appreciate each one that's watching online. And truly count it a privilege that God allows us this opportunity to come and meet together. So this evening, as we go to the Lord in prayer, let, let's just pray for the service tonight. Pray that, that God will bless, that He'll give me the touch that I need, that I'll say what he'd have me to say, and that uh, he'd just come down and he'd move, and that hearts would be stirred, we'd be lifted up, and be more about the Father's business. Let's pray for one another. Let's look around, see each one. There's people in here going through quite a lot, and so let's lift each other up. Let's lift up those that, that are in the hospitals and, and, and homesick. We'll talk about some of them in a little bit. Let's, let's just pray tonight for our church as a whole. That God will continue to bless and take care of us and watch over us. And, and that we'll be what He'd have us to be. So tonight as we go to the Lord in prayer. Roger, would you lead us please, we pray. I always thank you for another opportunity tonight. to be back in the house with the Lord. Lord, have your way. Uh, we just want to thank Roger for the blessings. The positive vision. Help us with us. Father, we send you all that we got to some. Father, we can have salvation. Father, we know we weren't worthy. We know that there was no other way to you. Father, you loved us enough. Father, you loved us enough. If you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 1 and Acts chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and Acts chapter 1. And I hope tonight you come praying. I hope you come seeking a blessing. And I'm going to be honest with you, one of the simplest messages I've ever tried to preach. I don't really know why the Lord's leading this way, but that's, hey, that's just how it is. And I'm going to do what I feel like he's leading me to do. You know, just got, like we have 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, we've got 1st and 2nd Kings, Samuel, Chronicles. You can almost look at the book of Acts as 2nd Luke. Same man wrote them. And again, I understand that Luke the physician, I firmly believe that he wrote those two books under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But he not only wrote about the gospel of Christ, he continued on in the book of Acts where Jesus got his disciples out on the Mount of Olives, how he ascended up into heaven, and told how those two men in white said he's coming back. He told how the church was born there on the day of Pentecost. And he gave a pretty good history of the church on that, just the way the church started and the way the church spread. So tonight, I, I beg you, please pray for him as I stand and I'll say what you'd have me to say. So if you're able tonight to stand in respect to the Word of God, In Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 1, 
He says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, he says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Thank you. You can be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Fathers, we come to you again tonight. We thank you. We praise you for the day that you've given us and for the blessings and mercies of life. We thank you for the way that you've watched over us. You've supplied our needs. You've given us health and strength and took care of us. Father, tonight I know that every good thing we have is from you. Without you, we'd have nothing. I thank you tonight, Father, for the privilege we have to be back in your house for each one of these that's made their way out. I thank you tonight, God, that we've got this opportunity to come and meet together again. I thank you for those that are watching online tonight. I ask you to bless them. But Father, I thank you more than anything tonight for saving me. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for that finished work at Calvary. I thank you, Father, that he did it all. He didn't leave anything out. He didn't leave anything undone, but Father, he went to that cross and laid his life down, shed his blood, died and gave his life as a ransom for many. I'm thankful tonight, Father, that blood he shed was sufficient to cleanse me of my sin. And I beg you, God, tonight, forgive me where I've failed you, where I've come short, where I've let you down from the things that I've said, I've done, and i thought that was displeasing to you. I pray, God, you remove them and take them away. Father, tonight I beg you to help me as I stand and try to preach. God, I ask you for that fresh touch, that fresh anointing from on high. I ask you, Father, just to come down and bless in the way that you see fit. I ask you, God, to take away anything that might hinder or quench your spirit. I ask you, God, tonight to overshadow this place. I ask you, God, tonight that hearts will be stirred, souls will be lifted up, that your people will be encouraged, be challenged, I ask you, God, tonight to watch my mouth, guard my lips, don't let me say it wrong. Don't let me lead anybody astray, but Father, only help me to say and do what you'd have done. Go with us now through the service. Have your way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as Paul wrote two letters to the Corinthians, he wrote two letters to the Thessalonians, he wrote the letter to the Galatians, to the Philippians, to the Colossians and to the Romans. It was like they had a specific place to go to. But even though they were to a specific group, they were still inspired by the hand of God. As Luke is writing these two letters, he's writing them to a man by the name of Theophilus that I don't know anything else about him. But he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, he says in Luke chapter 1, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, we need to understand tonight that the gospel of Christ, the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ are absolutes. They took place. We don't have to be religious to understand that Jesus was born. We don't have to be religious to understand that Jesus had a ministry. We don't have to be religious to believe that Jesus died on the cross. That's a historical fact. Mm -hmm. But you've got to have a faith to believe that He came out of that tomb victorious over that hell and the grave. And, if, and, and Luke not only talks about how He did indeed come out of that tomb, he tells us what happened after he came out of that tomb. Mm -hmm. So he said this was not just a figment of our imagination. 
He was dead. Those Roman soldiers made sure he was dead. You know, the Bible says that he gave up the ghost. He bowed his head. He died. People didn't usually die that quick from crucifixion. So he even tells us how the, the, the Roman soldier took that spear and shoved it up in to his chest. And out came blood and water. They made sure he was dead. They were very efficient at their job. So there's only one reason, one way possible, that four days later he was seen of plenty and seen of many. There's only one way that 40 days later, 500 people followed him out to the Mount of Olives. And that was for him to rise again. And Dr. Luke makes that a fact. He said of all these things that we have most certainly believed, even as they delivered them unto us, which unto us, listen, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. We don't hear much about Luke. We don't hear anything about Luke during the four Gospels of Jesus' ministry. But apparently Luke had followed him. Yeah. Luke watched him. Luke saw these things. Luke knew from first-hand experience. You know, as Peter said, you know, what we've given to you were not cunningly devised fables, but we were eyewitnesses. We heard the voices. We saw the things he did. And that's what Luke's trying to tell everybody. So he said, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order. Most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. And that word certainty literally means safety. It means security. In other words, what he's saying is, you can bank on what I'm telling you. You don't have to worry. You don't have to doubt. Luke says, when I give you the gospel, when I tell you that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, he said, you can bank your soul on it without any fear. That's right. So then when he gets over to Acts chapter 1, he sort of continues the accounts. And he says, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he threw the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. And he talks on down about how he showed himself and, and different things. But I want to look at verse 1 tonight and be sort of concerned with that more than anything else, centered in on that, on just one phrase out of verse number 1. And he says, Of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Now if we went through, I know what John said over in, Oh, in 1 John chapter, I think it's chapter 5, when he says, if everything that Jesus had done, no, he don't. He says that in the gospel, not over in 1 John. Yeah. If everything that Jesus did was written down, the, the, the world couldn't contain the books. That's right. And tonight, I can't cover, and I'm not going to attempt to cover. But there was a few things that the Lord brought to mind of the things that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now, there were things that Jesus did that, no, I can't do. But there are those things that what he did, by doing those, he taught us something, and those things you and I can do. That's right. mm -hmm. So, he says those things that Jesus began to do and teach. So every, pretty much most of the scriptures I'm going to give you tonight is out of the book of Luke. But in Luke chapter number 4, the Bible talks about how, the, and it goes right along with Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus was led the, will, the Spirit up in the wilderness. And the Bible says he was tempted of the devil. After fasting 40 days, 40 nights, he was hungry, thirsty, and he was tired, and then the devil came to him. Now, let me tell you something. You and I don't always do what Jesus did. When the devil began to tempt him, he answered him with Scripture. That's right, and that's why that he that knew no sin became sin for us. Right. Not one temptation that was ever thrown in front of him did he fall to. There was not one temptation that he ever yielded to. There was not one temptation that ever tripped him up. You and I can't say that. Right. You and I are imperfect people. Thank God I've got a, a perfect God and i got a perfect spirit dwelling on the inside. But sometimes, and this is not an excuse to sin, just as Jesus said about the disciples over in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
Yeah, the flesh or the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you and I don't always live perfect. You and I don't always get to the point where every temptation that comes to us, you know, something will be done or something will be said or something will be thought. But not one time did Jesus yield. And you say, well, preacher, I'm not perfect like Jesus. Was. No, you're not. So we might not be able to do what Jesus did, but Jesus taught us what we can do. The Bible tells us, 1 John chapter 2, and how many times have you heard this in the last five or six weeks? That every temptation that comes to us is either the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. Every one of those that come to us. When it, if it's something that feels good, we want to do it. If it's something that catches our eye and we see it, then we want it. If somebody begins to, you know, I tried to preach Sunday night on being humble. You know, it's easy for us to get lifted up. It's easy for us to be prideful. It's easy for us to get the big head. But in everything, see, even Jesus, it's even John chapter 6 or John chapter 7, his brothers, who did not at that time even believe who Jesus was, his brethren said to him, hey, it's time to go down to, to Jerusalem to the feast. If you're really who you say you're going down there, because everybody will want to see you. And Jesus held back after everybody else went. See, Jesus wasn't there to put on a show. He wasn't there to have himself lifted up. He came to do the will of the Father. He knew where he was going. He knew he was going to the cross. He knew that the sins of all mankind was going to be poured out on him. See, even himself, who he was, God made flesh, God incarnate, and yet he humbled himself, as I said the other night. So he wasn't worried about being prideful. He wasn't worried about being lifted up. But he showed you and I that every temptation that comes to us falls into one of those three categories. Just as what came to Jesus. And though we might not be able to do what he did and the way he handled that, he taught us how to handle it. Give the scripture. That's why we need to hide that word in our heart. We need to know what the word of God says. And the reason most people today are walking afar off from God and the reason Christians aren't as, aren't as close as they ought to be to God is we don't know enough about the Word of God to even know how to live a lot of times. Yeah. Right. Yep, you're right. That's why we live a lot of times, we live compromised lives instead of living separated lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are things that we ought to do and we don't do. And a lot of times I've had people ask me questions, been in church for years. And they'd say, why do you believe like that? And I'd give them scripture and they'd say, why have I never heard it? And my question to them is, why have you never read it? We depend too much just on what we hear at church. What we ought to be doing is spending some time in that word ourselves. Yeah. Right. Now I understand Jesus Christ was the author of this book. Mm -hmm. I understand it was... He was the one who breathed these words as those holy men of old wrote the, wrote the words and held the pen. But he told us. He showed us and we know what he did. But we also heard what he taught. And in James chapter 4, he still says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Yeah. Draw him out of God and he'll draw him out of you. Right, amen. But you know what? Most of us don't have a whole lot of resistance. It's real easy a lot of times for the devil to get us to do what he wants us to do. Yeah, you're right. You know, the majority, and, and, and down through my Christian life, and especially trying to pastor, <laughs> the, the majority of the hurt and the majority of the stir and the majority of the devil's work gets done by professing, professing Christians. Yep. Right. Yeah, you're right. It does. They'll hurt you. Some there's Christians that are mean and snakes, mm -hmm. and will hurt you and enjoy it while they're doing. Yeah. And some of them will say, "Well, I just didn't mean." Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Because the devil put a thought in their head about, well, this ain't going your way, or this ain't going to make you look real good, or blah 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 blah. And what they'll do is they have very little resistance to the devil. We don't wear the armor of God like we're supposed to wear. 
And when you talk to people about the armor of God, they're like, what are you talking about? Hmm. You know, we all have that shield of faith. If you ain't, look, if you've got the helmet of salvation, if you don't want nothing else, at least take the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's right. But He told us, we might not be able to, we're, and, and we're not going to live perfect like Christ did, but He taught us how mm -hmm. to get out of the clutches of the devil. That's right. And it doesn't just say, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. What's the next verse say? Mm -hmm. Draw him out of God, and he'll draw him out of you. Yeah. And then it, I think it goes right along to say, cleanse your hearts, you sinners. Purify your hands, you double-minded. Mm -hmm. We've got to learn. The reason the world's in the shape it's in, and I'm not trying to repeat everything I said Sunday night. But God made us a promise. Not that the wicked had to get right for him to heal our land. But for God's people to get right. Mm -hmm. And he'd heal our land. So in Luke chapter 4, what he did was resist the devil. What he taught us was that we can resist him too. So he said of all the things Jesus began both to do and to teach. In Luke chapter 7, he taught us a couple of lessons. A centurion came to him and said, Master, my servants at home, sick unto death, you're the only hope he's got. Now that's that's not King James. That's a paraphrase. That's what that man told him. You don't touch him. You don't heal him. He's going to die. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, I'll go heal him. That man made a statement. Now I know what Jesus did. Jesus looked at his faith. And Jesus acted on that faith and rewarded that faith. But that man told Jesus, he said, I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. He said, I'm a man of great authority. And if you stopped and didn't read much of that, you'd think he was just bragging on himself. He said, I'm a man of great authority. If I tell somebody to go, they go. If I tell somebody to come, they come. All I got to do is say the word. He said, Master, all you got to do is say the word because I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, I ain't seen faith like this anywhere in Israel. And understand something. This man was a centurion. That meant he was a Roman. That meant he was a pagan. That meant he'd grown up worshiping all these pagan gods, not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they told Jesus, this man, he had helped them and he was a good man. But he taught us something. It's more than just faith. Now, I know we've got to have that faith. But we've got to get to the point that we need to learn in that passage of Scripture that there's not a one of us worthy for Jesus to live in this house. There's not a one of us worthy of Him getting down in the dirt like that woman taken in adultery. There's not a one of us worthy of Him picking us up out of the miry clay and setting our feet on a solid rock. You and I are a state that reaches the high heaven without the grace of God. We are sinful. We're nasty. We're hell deserving. There is not one thing good about me and you. See, I understand what I am. But I'm afraid most people in the world don't. And I know that Jesus acted on that faith and Jesus was thankful for that faith. He was glad to see that faith of a man. That's all you got to do. And I know He taught us in that passage of Scripture that if we will have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, we can say to that mountain, move to the sea and that mountain's going to move. Mm -hmm. But again, that passage of Scripture tells every one of us or reminds us, I'm not good enough to have Christ in my life. I have talked to too many people in my life that 
are good enough, they don't have to go to church. They're good enough, they don't have to accept Christ. They're good enough that they're going to get to heaven on their works. They're good enough that their good is going to outweigh their bad. And one of the biggest, that's one of the biggest problems in our world today and one of the loudest messages that needs to be shouted from the rooftops outside of the fact that Jesus saved souls. We need to understand the fact that Paul, just like he told Timothy, Jesus has come to save sinners. Absolutely. But Paul said, of whom I am chief. People in this world don't like the fact when you tell them without Christ, they're going to hell. Yeah. And there's a lot of professing Christians that if you walked up to them like I'm about to do, Brother Kenny, you deserve to go to hell. You've got no right to heaven. Mm -hmm. And a whole lot of church members going to get mad and haunted over that statement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we don't understand what we are and who we are. That there's not a one of us worthy. Mm -hmm. None of us. When, think about John the Baptist. Jesus said there's not a man born a woman that's any greater than John the Baptist. John the last Old Testament prophet. You know, they, he's back out of the way when, when, when John had every right to be in the temple on a daily basis. See, that, that temple priesthood was a, was a hereditary thing. was an inherited thing. But he didn't show up at the, at the temple every day. Remember, his daddy Zacharias was a priest, remember? But all of a sudden, he was kept hid till the day of his showing to Israel. And he was out at the Jordan River in the valley preaching that there was one coming. And when John, the way he preached and the people came to him and he warned them that, and he told them that Messiah was coming, he told them, you better get right. They said, are you him? And he said, not only am I not him, he said, the one that's coming after me, he said, I'm not even worthy to bow down and unloose his shoe latch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to know tonight and understand if we've never picked up on it. That very seldom ever when the master of the house received visitors into his house, the master didn't get down and wash their feet. That was the job of the lowliest slave. Yeah. It was the slave that got down, took off them dusty shoes, washed them feet, dried them feet, got the dust and dirt and stuff off of them shoes, made sure there was not a pebble, made sure there was not sand or anything inside of them before they put them back on them feet. That was the lowly servant's job. And that's what blew their mind that night before the crucifixion, that Jesus bowed down on his knees and washed their feet. And John the Baptist, the one that Jesus said, never been a man born great. For John the Baptist said, I ain't even worthy to loosen his shoe latch. Yeah. And John himself was saying, I am lower than the lowest slave that the rich man owns. Mm -hmm. You didn't get the kitchen help to wash people's feet. You didn't get the, the girls that made the beds and cleaned the house to wash feet. As a master job. You got the lowest ones to do that. And John said, I'm not even worthy to do that. That's why he said, unloose his shoe latch. He didn't say loose it back or tighten it back up. He said unloose because the one that unloosed was the one that washed the feet. And he said, I'm not even worthy to do that. Tonight, who do we think we are? And maybe this is still going along with that humbleness from Sunday night, but why do we think that we are really more? Without Christ, who are we? I'm dirt. Without Him picking me up out of the dirt, I'm still there. 
without him breathing into my nostrils the breath of life, I'm dead spiritually. Yeah. But thank God the day how God saved, I got that new breath. Amen. Breathed on us just like he did on the day of Pentecost, and I got saved by the grace of God. Yeah. But until that happened, I wasn't even worthy for him to be in my presence. That's why in Revelation chapter 5, John wept. The Father's on the throne. He's got the book in his hand. Who's worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And John said, I wept because there was nobody worthy. Mm -hmm. Not one individual. Not Gabriel, not Michael, not any of those four and twenty elders sitting there. None of those created beings that were, were there. The church that was in a tent, nobody was worthy. And John said, when I looked around and saw nobody, he said, I began to weep. I began to cry, but all of a sudden I heard a voice say, Weep not, John. Mm. For behold, the line of the tribe of Judah Amen. has prevailed to open the book. Nobody. Nobody. Those angels can't do what they do without the power of God. You and I can't do what we do by, without the power of God. And you and I certainly can't be saved without the power of God. Amen. And that centurion said, God, I'm not even worthy for you to enter into my house. One of these days we're gonna, we'll learn that. You move over a chapter. They're going across the sea. In Luke chapter 8, they're going across the sea. and That's when he does a sleep in the back part of the boat. You can go to, what is it, Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 4 and read the same thing. And they wake him up and they're scared. And in just three or four words, mm -hmm. the storm has come. And they look at him in amazement. And you say, preacher, I can't calm the storm. He didn't tell us we could. No, that's right. He calmed the storm. That's what he did. Right. But he told us, and he taught us, that he could take care of that storm. Amen. We go through them every day of our life. I don't care where it's at. Things will come up at home. Things will come up on the job. Things will come up. Things can come up at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to tell this. A couple of weeks ago, we were at a, a Walmart, and I didn't really know what was going on. And Gwen told me later what what she saw. And we were in a the pile had the potential of being in a real ugly situation mm -hmm. when a man had his buggy turned crossways in the aisle blocking people and it was almost like he was daring them to come by. So we come on these storms every day of our life. And no, I can't speak and the storm go away. Mm -hmm. So we know what he did, but we also know what he taught. <coughs> And we need to keep in mind and don't ever forget, it does not matter how big the storm, how deep the valley, how tall the mountain, or how dark the skies are, or whatever is going on. He is still able to bring us through whatever we're going through. That's right. Talking to a man a while ago that told me how God had answered a prayer for them. Just yesterday. Some have been praying for for a while. And we look around and we see things happen in our life. As, as David said in Psalm 37, I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Yeah. You say, preacher, there's things, there are need, there's a need in my life, and I can't meet it. No, but the word of God has taught us that God will. That's right, amen. You say, well, not everything that has been met. Well, maybe not everything's a need. Yeah. Because he promised us in the book of Philippians that he would supply all our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. What storm are you going through right now? What are you, what are you, what are you facing? You say, preacher, I got some money situations.
that, that, that something's got to be said and quit. And if it don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. You do remember the account when they came up to the Apostle Peter and said, Does your master not pay tribute? He goes to tell Jesus. He didn't answer him. Jesus said, I'll tell you what. Let's just make them happy. Go take a hook. He's a fisherman. He's always got a hook. Drop that hook over in the sea. You pull up the first fish you've got. Open the fish's mouth and get out a piece of money and pay the, pay the taxes. He said, Preacher, that's silly. That ain't never going to... Don't, don't tell me what's silly and what ain't. Yeah. I've seen too much and walking across the parking lot at Lowe's one night we was and... and Gwen said, is that real? There wasn't nobody else around. It's almost closing down. Nobody parked around there. And there's two $20 bills blowing along the parking lot. I said, yes, they are. <laughs> and they ours. Thank you, Lord. And that's yep. what I said. That's right. I wasn't being funny. Yeah. I wasn't making light. I said, thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. And if he can pull a piece of money out of a fish's mouth, if he can blow it across Lowe's parking lot, yeah. He can take care of what you and I need. That's right. What he did was calm the storm. Mm -hmm. What he taught us was to trust him. That's right. Because he called them fearful. He called them men of little faith. And tonight, we where's our faith? We don't have it. Even when everybody walks away from us because of what we're facing. Thank God He has promised us. He didn't jump out of the boat and leave them to their own devices. Right. He was still in the boat with them. And I'm glad tonight the book of Proverbs tells us that He is that friend that sticks closer than a brother. Right. When the storm comes, I can't calm the storm. But I can trust Him to get me through it. Mm -hmm. So we, we can look back through those Gospels. And I don't think we spend enough time in the book as a whole, but I definitely am sure we don't spend enough time in the Gospels. So we can look at the things that it says that he began to do and to teach. So he's taught us how to get rid of temptation. He's taught us how to run the devil off, for lack of a better phrase. He's taught us how to realize that, hey, you know what? Don't depend on yourself because ain't none of us worthy. Get, get rid of the big head. He's taught us that no, we can't calm a storm. But that he'll get us through it. And I'm going to quit with this. In chapter 23, he's hanging on the cross. Dying for you and me. Shedding that blood for you and me. Getting ready for the wrath of God to pour out on him. I know you ain't got nothing new tonight. Sometimes we just need to be reminded. And all of a sudden, he hears a voice over here that says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He's hearing from a hell-deserving sinner that's already looked into the mouth of hell and knows that very shortly he's going down into that pit. That very shortly, he's going into that place where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. Very shortly, he's going into that place that he will be tormented in those flames. And he looks over and he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Yeah. None of us are worthy. He wasn't worthy. And at that point, realizing he's getting ready to step out into eternity, the worst storm he'd ever been in in his life. And don't tell me he wasn't being tempted because the devil's looking at him and saying, ain't no point looking at the man on the milk cross. He's in the same situation you're in. He ain't going to do you a bit of good. So the whole time the devil's tempting him to say nothing. The whole time he knows he's unworthy. The whole time he realizes I'm facing the biggest, the worst thing that I could ever face in my life. Who does he turn to? Mm -hmm. 
Lord, remember me. And Jesus could have looked at him and said, Boy, you ain't done nothing. I got no use for you. But he looked at him. And he said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And saved a man that was just right before dropping into hell. Now, can I tell you something? There's not a one of us can do what Jesus did. But He taught us that it doesn't matter how bad somebody is, and it doesn't matter how bad their past is, and it doesn't matter what kind of baggage they've got or what kind of history they've got, that thank God there's a God in heaven that came to seek and to save that which was lost, that same Jesus tonight taught us no way you can't save them. But don't you give up on them. That's right. And I don't know who you got in your life. Whether it's family or whether it's neighbors. Might be some good friends. And there ain't a blessed thing you can do to save their soul. Mm -hmm. You can't lay hands on them. You can't anoint them with oil. You can't cut your wrists and pour your blood out on them and save them. Mm. But don't you give up on them. That's right. Don't you stop praying for them. Don't you stop inviting them to church. Don't you stop living the life before them that set the right example. Don't you stop letting them see you live the way a child of God ought to live. Mm. This man was right before going to hell. And thank God when he took his last breath, he was in the presence of Jesus. Today Amen. shalt thou be with me in paradise. In Luke chapter 19, he took a crooked tax collector that you know he was crooked. That was just the way the system worked. And thank God Zacchaeus took him home with him. And Jesus said, today is salvation come to this house. Mm -hmm. You can look at Acts chapter 8. And the Bible says when Philip was down in Samaria, the Bible says that that revival started and that the whole city, the whole city came together with one accord and believed what he preached. We see in Acts chapter 9, a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus that did nothing, but the Bible says breathed threatenings and slaughters to the people of God. And this man who had, who had hated, hated the very church of Christ, hated the very people of Christ, hated the things uh, that, that had anything to do with Jesus. The one that said, here, I'll hold your coat while you stone him. Stephen, name him one good time for me. He met Jesus on the Damascus road and said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Went down to Damascus to the street called Straight, prayed and fasted three days and three nights, a man by the name of Ananias came in, prayed over and laid hands on him. His blindness disappeared. And he began to preach Jesus. You say, he didn't know enough to preach Jesus. He knew what he used to be and he knew what he was right then. And then you see in Acts chapter 10, we talk about Peter where he used the keys of the kingdom. And I'm done. Use the keys of the kingdom to open the doors to the Gentiles. But again, realize who Cornelius was. Cornelius was another centurion. Mm -hmm. Cornelius had a band of Roman soldiers under him. Yeah. He was a man of authority. Understand what happens when a Roman citizen accepted Christ as Savior. That was blasphemy to the Roman Emperor. Mm -hmm. The Roman Emperors viewed themselves as gods. That's why when they asked Jesus, is it lawful? You know, the, the, the money. Jesus said, show me the penny. Is it lawful to give tribute? Show me the penny. Whose image is on that? Caesar's? He said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, render unto God the things that are God. If 
it had that picture on there. And that's why they did not put that money in the, in the temple treasury. It's because Caesar considered himself a god. You committed blasphemy against your emperor, which was immediately punishable by death if you chose another god over him. But the Bible says the apostle Peter walked through the door. Cornelius bowed down on his knees. And he said, get up, I'm a man like you are. He said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. He began to preach Jesus. The power of the Holy Ghost fell on that house. And everybody that was in there was saved. And understand what Cornelius did before he ever got saved. He went around and told everybody, the man of God's coming. You need to come to my house. Mm -hmm. Had a prayer meeting in his house and didn't even know Jesus. And invited a house full. So when you take people like that, that we would have marked off people like that, that we'd have said, ain't a chance. God said, oh yeah. I can save to the uttermost all those that come to me by Christ Jesus. So tonight, we can't do what Jesus did. But he taught us what we can do. Mm -hmm. So tonight I I can't defeat the devil by myself, but Jesus said, told me how I can defeat him. You know, I can't I can't heal that centurion servant, but I can understand how unworthy I am for him to come to my house. I can't steal a storm. But thank God I can have faith in the one that can and I sure can't save people. But I can pour them to Calvary. Folks, that's why I've told you during invitation time, I won't tell you what to do to get saved. I'll show you what to do to get saved. Mm -hmm. I guess the first time I ever heard the phrase lead somebody to the Lord, I heard that from Brother Roscoe Bowden. Mm -hmm. I thought, what's he talking about leading somebody? And I say, and then I realized, you know what? He ain't trying to get nobody to even remotely think he did the saving. Right. Mm -hmm. He's just showing them how to get to Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what you and I. Wasn't it Philip and Andrew? And Andrew said, hey, we found him. You need to come and see him. <laughs> Well, that's what we need to do. Doesn't matter how far off they are. Doesn't matter how, how far gone they might be. Thank God He's still able to reach. Yeah. He's still able to save. So tonight we can't do what Jesus did. But He taught us how to handle those same circumstances. I don't know what your Bible reading habits are like. You say, preacher, I just read when I get a chance. No, you need to set aside some time to read. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Make some time during the day at some point. Mm -hmm. I got too much to do. Well, if you ain't got time to spend at least 15, 20, 30 minutes in the Word, you way too busy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't care who y'all. Yeah. I don't care who y'all. We're never going to know how to live if we don't look at the instruction book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can't do what He did. But we can follow his lessons and do what he taught us to do. Father, we thank you for the day and thank you for the opportunity to come and meet together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you for allowing us to look at a portion of your word. Lord, I pray tonight I said what you'd have me to say. I pray tonight it made sense. I pray tonight that it helped somebody. I pray tonight that it lifted somebody up. God, I realize tonight I cannot do what Jesus did. But Father, I'm thankful tonight that He did teach us how to handle situations. And I'm thankful tonight, Father, that even though I can't save anybody, You've made it plain that it doesn't matter how far off they are, You're still able to go get them. Now Father, I ask You to continue to bless this church, bless these folks that's here. You watch over us and have Your way through the rest of the service. For we ask it in Jesus' name.
Amen.